Good afternoon. 406 now. News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up, Congresswoman Virginia Fox joins us at 5 o'clock. She was in that hearing yesterday with those brave IRS whistleblowers. We'll get her account of what she saw and heard. And Mary Margaret Olihan is here at 530, reporter with The Daily Signal, to talk about how YouTube is now censoring the stories of detransitioners. These are people who realize that they were not born in the wrong bodies, who have escaped from radical gender ideology. So YouTube punishes them for telling the truth. You can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. I was playing audio for you just a moment ago from the weaponization hearing today about the government's censorship of the American people in league with corporate America. And uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. has had his posts censored on a frequent basis by these big tech companies at the order at the behest of the government. And uh, he was laying out the details and then he gave an impassioned speech calling for more speech and more love in our country. And it's the only way to bring us forward. Uh, And that immediately led to this moment as Debbie Wasserman Schultz called for his censorship. One of order pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2 which Mr. Kennedy is violative of, I move that we remove into an executive session because Mr. Kennedy has repeatedly made despicable anti-Semitic and anti-Asian comments as recently as last week. Rule 11, Clause 2 says, whenever it is asserted by a member of the committee... Anyway, that- and then she goes on, blah, 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 blah. She calls for a vote. They, they vote to keep him in the hearing, and the hearing continues. Uh, and then there's a Delegate Stacey Plaskett, the fake congresswoman, who started screaming about how uh, he's not allowed to speak either. Kind he's neither. No. Neither. I'm just saying in past history. Okay, in okay. We'll, Let's we'll give, just we'll watch give you... the time for all the witnesses. And then. if you want to cut him off and censor him some more, you're welcome to do it. Oh, that's not my job. That's that's your job. Why don't you threaten a witness so that they can Mr. not want to be Mr. a witness? Uh, no, uh, I'm rubber. You're glue. Stacey Plaskett acting like a child today. Uh, for more on what went down in that wild hearing, Emily Jashinsky joins us now. The culture editor over at The Federal is also the co-host of CounterPoints. Emily, great to have you with us. Hey, Vin. Thanks for having me. Um, I thought it was a very fascinating hearing today, including the the panic by the Democrats that there was any conversation around government censorship. Actually, that's a really good point, because a lot of the attention has been focused on what witnesses were saying and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But what was, I think, equally, if not more interesting, is the Democrat freak out um, over even asking these questions, which I guess is sort of uh, proves the entire point yes. of why they're doing this hearing, because they no longer want questions to be asked. It reminds me a lot of when Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger testified not too long ago. Democrats found every excuse to uh, attack their credibility to the point where this was just like Olympic level gymnastics. And I think we saw the exact same thing happen today. Um, if not at a, at a higher level, because it start, it's starting to feel like the, the dam is really breaking yes. on this Biden. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about it is it's not explicitly partisan either. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a bit more about the power of the government that these Democrats are zealously guarding because – if they, if they wanted to, if they were trying to be honest about this, they could say, well, some of the censorship was happening under the Trump administration. Much of it was. Remember, that first Hunter Biden laptop story was censored while Donald Trump was still president of the United States. If the Democrats wanted to turn this into a partisan contest, they could. Oh, well, this happened under Trump and it shouldn't happen. But that's not what they're doing. They're zealously guarding the right to prevent the American people from finding out information that's inconvenient to the government. That's a fascinating point because I recently actually went, you know, just sort of trying to sort through all of these allegations. I went back and looked at a couple of them to, to find the date and to see if this was something that was actually happening by sort of rogue actors in the, you know, the FBI and the Department of Justice under Donald Trump. And yes, I mean, so much of this does go back to things that happened under the Trump administration, which tells us a couple of things. Uh, one, that, yeah, you have rogue actors who were basically trying to take Donald Trump down or boost Democrats yes. under Trump's watch um, and to do it without you know other people in the executive branch knowing, even though that's to whom they're supposed to be accountable. Uh, and on the other hand, it's such a good point that this could be a partisan cudgel. This could be a huge weapon uh, Democrats would wield against Republicans. But I think they've weighed the cost benefit analysis and realized the cost of doing that isn't worth what they see as the benefit yes. of just 
massively increasing their power over the flow of information. And they can't also, importantly with the Hunter Biden saga, they can't acknowledge the validity of the Hunter Biden story or else it would undermine the current head of their party, Joe Biden. So that's why we end up with hearings like the one we had today where you have a bunch of excellent witnesses talking about the ways in which they and their reporting was censored uh, and Democrats just freaking out uh, and, and accusing them of being purveyors of hate speech. Yeah, they can't they cannot compute. It's amazing. And and for some of them, it's it's one of two things. For some of them, it is willfully dishonest. And for others of them, it's just they have these incredible partisan blinders on that when you have Robert F. Kennedy talking about how the Democratic Party used to be the anti-censorship party, to the extent that that's actually true. Um, but you had him sort of waxing nostalgic about the Democratic Party of yore and the values that the Democratic Party is supposed to represent. And then all of the Democrats on the committee just and in the entire House, like, pivot and prove him right completely like immediately prove that they're just completely antithetical their values are completely antithetical to the values that people used to proudly represent um in this country and so they just went out and proved him exactly right and they're you know a small that is a very small group of the country that agrees with them um on what should be censored censored and that the limits should be what they want them to be uh, but they're losing control and they're freaking out about it and to the extent that people have hope um, I think in our system, just looking at what happened with the two IRS whistleblowers over the last couple of days, Shakely yes. and Ziegler, um, Democrats, by the way, you know, people who are clearly not supportive of the Republican Party at the very least and don't have any motivation. They know that all they're going to do is get attacked and just killed in the media for speaking out, actually speaking out, because for some people like this corruption level is actually intolerable. The censorship is actually intolerable. Um, and whether they're your RFK Jr. or Ziegler and Shapley, uh, it, it should give us hope to know that some people are speaking out. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 there was a moment today where uh, a particularly smug, arrogant Democrat congressman named Dan Goldman um, was <laughs> accusing uh, the New York Post of not having done the footwork to corroborate the reality of the laptop. Now, that was a lie. The, the New York Post clearly had. Uh, Emma Jo Morris was the person who was, was now, now at Breitbart, but she was the uh, deputy politics editor at the New York Post whose name was on the byline. And she said, yeah, we, we checked that out. And he said, well, I doubt the New York Post— has the forensic capability to even authenticate the laptop. But he's alighting, uh, Emily Jasinski, all sorts of history here. We know that multiple news, news organizations, among the earliest, the Daily Caller, did consult forensics experts, did verify the validity of these emails, did establish they actually came and went to Hunter Biden's email account, and therefore are, of course, completely newsworthy. Uh, and yet to this very day, Democrats are pretending like there's a chance it may be fake. And that's the other amazing thing. I mean, we've learned in the last couple of days that Twitter got confirmation from the FBI that the laptop was real because the FBI had had it for a while and the FBI confirmed the validity of that. Now, remember, all kinds of people in that community signed that 51 former intelligence officer a letter that gave media kind of that fig leaf to censor the story enormously. But Twitter knew that, and Twitter censored all of this anyway to, to an extent. It's just that they simply don't care, yes. and they're willing to comment any values that they even think they have for the supposed greater good of shutting down conversation, period. They don't want to have a conversation about the Bidens. They don't want to ask questions about corruption because they think they know what's best for the country. And if they lose power, the country will spiral out of control. And the, the actual, you know, uh, the, the real American people, the unwashed masses will have a say in our government. And that is a bridge too far for them now. Um, here is uh, some from uh, some of the testimony today from Emma Jo Morris. She's now at Breitbart. But again, she was the byline on the New York Post report that first came out uh, in October of 2020. And here's what she said about the reception to that report by the deep state clowns who sought to bury it. The Post published exactly how the material for the reporting was obtained, even identifying our sources, um, as well as a federal subpoena showing the FBI was in possession of the material the story was based on and had been since December of 2019. Um, but when the stories appeared on social media that morning, the venue where millions of Americans go to find their news and editors to get their angles, uh, within hours, the reporting was censored on all major platforms on the basis of being called hacked or Russian disinformation. Um, Twitter refused to allow 
users to share the link to the stories, ban the links from being shared in private messages, a policy, by the way, that's used to clamp down on child porn um, and lock the post out of its verified account. Facebook said it would curb distribution and reach of the links on its platform. However, the stories were not based on hacked materials, nor were they Russian disinformation. And despite those claims appearing to come out of thin air at the time, we would eventually learn that they actually didn't come out of thin air at all. On October 19th, five days after the Post began publishing, Politico ran a story headlined, Hunter Biden's story is Russian disinfo, dozens of former intel officials say. God, I can't even say that with a straight face, you know? Yeah, because it's a joke. Emily Jashinsky, and uh, yet that was the pretext. You had people who knew better. The FBI had the laptop from December of 2019. They admitted to Twitter on the day of the New York Post's coverage that the, that the laptop was real, and yet the censorship effort began. That is just the most, I, I think it is the most Ill illuminating point in all of this, that if people have any illusions that this is a, a gray area or, you know, Twitter just made the wrong call and they, they, you know, Jack Dorsey eventually kind of walked back and Zuckerberg has kind of walked it back to, no, absolutely not. They knew it was clear as day. It was black and white at the time that this was, you know, let's say they didn't even want to trust the New York Post and they had, you know, that embarrassing Dan Goldman sentiment towards the New York Post, uh, which shows you know, again, just partisan blinders and how stupid that can make you, even if that's where you are, then the FBI, which you revere, tells you it's real. And you can't even like you're still going to censor it. That just tells you absolutely everything you need to know about this is that they don't they genuinely don't care about, uh, you know, the, the free press. Yes. They don't care about uh, facts. They just care about power. RFK Jr. gave an impassioned opening remark today. He, that I, I played some of it. Um, I, I'll note that he didn't actually read from his prepared remarks because by the time he started speaking, Democrats had already launched so many attacks on him, he felt uh, compelled to respond to them. Uh, and so he spoke from the heart extemporaneously. And as he was speaking, he reminded everyone that the United States led the world in this commitment to free speech and that many countries actually model their free speech principles on the United States, and that if we fail to honor our commitment to the First Amendment, this this will all collapse. Our republic does not work unless the First Amendment is honored and, the, and speech itself is robust. Um, do you think the Democrats got that message today, or do they understand, perhaps they understand how important speech is, and that's only made them double down their resolve to censor it? I'm with you. Um, I think the more that, that, that we have these conversations, the more they smear uh, people as conspiracy theorists and bigots um, because it's, it's illuminated for them, especially over the course of COVID. Uh, and we've been getting new emails uh, from the, the sort of inside behind the curtain over the last couple of weeks, too, about what influential, powerful elites were doing to obscure information about COVID that has now largely been vindicated. They were doing it then, but COVID was such an example for them of how, you know, true information they feel like can be dangerous uh, because they don't, they fundamentally don't trust their peers. They don't trust their neighbors. They don't trust the American people. Um, they think they need the final say. Their judgment is the only judgment uh, that should govern the country. And so to your point, Vince, I think it, this is all just highlighted to them uh, that they are losing their power. And we've seen that for technological reasons. The, the old uh, gatekeepers are getting bypassed. You know, Tucker just hosted that uh, great conversation with all of the 2024 candidates on the blaze last week. You know, they, these old gatekeepers are losing their power. The New York Post is getting scoops. The New York Times probably wishes that it had. Yeah. Um, they, they're losing their power. And so they're clinging even harder to it because they think that's the only way to sort of control the unwashed masses. And I've noticed the more panicked they get, the more tyrannical they become. So this is a dangerous moment. Um, <laughs> Emily Jashinsky, thank you very much, as always, over at The Federalists. And you can hear her on CounterPoints as well. Emily, thank you you so much. Wow. The irony and cognitive dissonance from the other side of the aisle. It's deafening. You could cut it with a knife. They are at the same time denying that censorship is occurring, but suggesting that there's more material that needs to be censored. This is a hearing on censorship that began with an effort, with a formal motion from the other side of the aisle to censor Mr. Kennedy. They do not want him to speak. 
Yet that is the topic of this hearing. They have kept him from speaking. Congressman Thomas Massey pointing out that the Democrats' only answer to the censorship hearing is to censor it. Uh, that was the that was the plan today. Uh, it is. It was so crazy listening to the lefties today on this committee. Uh, when they weren't calling for censorship, they were suggesting that they should be talking about more important issues like inflation. Here's the fake Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett today. Why are we here? Why? You know, that's been the question that quite a number of people have been asking me. Nobody asked you that. You just made that up. Why are you having this hearing? What does this have to do with inflation? What does this have to do with the cost of living? <laughs> you know, I was listening to this live today. And when she said that, I did a spit take. Why aren't we talking about inflation? I'm sorry. I thought your party's position on inflation was that it wasn't happening. <laughs> Everything is fine. So the second you need inflation to be an issue for the American public, you you uh, you bring it up just as a distraction from your censorship. <laughs> Why aren't we talking about inflation, says the party that pretends it's not happening. <laughs> Uh, what does Donald Trump say? What's the phrase? They're not sending their best. <laughs> They're not sending their best. They're the Democrats. This is why they need censorship. They're not, not exactly able to battle it out in the arena of ideas. If they can just shut you up, they can win. That's the plan anyway. All right. Coming up. Congresswoman Virginia Fox is not far away. We'll chat with her about the IRS whistleblowers. Mary Margaret Olihan will join us on YouTube censorship. And Joe Biden can't take the tall stairs anymore. Details ahead. Well, good afternoon to you. It is 435 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Congresswoman Virginia Fox is joining us at 5 o'clock. We'll talk to her about the House Oversight Committee hearing yesterday with those IRS whistleblowers. More and more information coming out about the corruption of our government, the Biden family, our media, big corporations, all of them. Lump them all together. Impeach them all. Lock them up. Virginia Fox joins us soon. And Mary Margaret Olihan will be with us from the Daily Signal as YouTube is censoring reality yet again. And you can join us at 888-630-9625. 888-630-WMAL. Speaking of YouTube, the uh, the alternative economy is really kicking up again, uh, which is nice. It's uh, I, like normal Americans are looking for an answer. They're looking for something else. Uh, and so if you've been trying to get off of YouTube, if you're a content creator, one of the places you could go is Rumble. Rumble's been pretty successful. Now, I don't think that they're anywhere near the scale. I, th I think I can safely say they're nowhere near the scale that YouTube's at at the moment. Uh, but it, th they have some staying power, don't you think? You've seen a lot of these Rumble videos. They have a lot of exclusive contracts with various people who are appearing only on Rumble. Uh, so that's neat. And it's uh, and it gets it, it's outside of the YouTube censorship ecosystem, where if you, you know, if you glance the wrong way in a YouTube video, they'll they'll censor it. Like, no, 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 you can't have that. You can't have that. Um, you saw Facebook is starting started its own like crappy version of Twitter, which said that well you don't get too political or we'll censor you. We want we, basically they want a bunch of shallow, mindless content, kind of like TikTok on uh, their platform. But if you if you talk about politics and especially if you're conservative, uh, good luck. You're not going to make it. So not really sure what the point of that system is. And thankfully, we have an alternative. Twitter is a free speech platform, and there are some others out there. Uh, who are much more committed to free speech, and that's that's a good way to go. Today, though, uh, there was the announcement of um, the company Public Square, whose CEO, we had the CEO of Public Square on uh, this program some time ago, and Public Square is an app. Now, I'll disclose up front that I put a little bit of money in the stock market to invest in it. I think that's the kind of thing you're supposed to I didn't consult with a lawyer, but I should tell you. I put a little bit of money in the stock market to invest in it because I thought, this is a nice thing. It, this uh, it, It's an app uh, which lets you sort for local businesses that share your values, essentially, that aren't going to be beholden to left-wing ideology. Normal American businesses who love America, if you look on the app, it's called Public Square, you can look through it and you can 
find businesses in your again in your area that to do this, whether it's a tailor or a restaurant or you know, take your pick. And and different parts of the country are gonna have a lot more action than some others. But it's a neat thing and, and I hope it takes off. Oh, the other thing is they're um they they want to become like an Amazon style platform so that you can order products right from them and then it'll be delivered to your home. So you can just buy a product right there. Instead of you can patronize all these businesses, but you can do them, you know, from the convenience of your home. So that's cool. So I wish them a lot of success. But the reason I tell you about this is because this morning they rang the bell at the New York Stock Exchange because um, they for a while, the way it was set up, their their stock ticker was a different letter. It was under CLBR because there was a kind of a placeholder acquisition company that it, that was acquiring them. That all went through. And so today they finally changed their ticker symbol for Public Square. I believe it's PSQH. And... Uh, so they had the pleasure, the joy of ringing the opening bell this morning for the New York Stock Exchange. And this is what it sounded like on CNBC as it was going down. Jim Cramer was doing his normal like CNBC shtick where he gives you recommendations that are in, in the end going to fail. Uh, and while he was doing that, the bell starts going off. And right up on the dais is the executive team for Public Square. And, and Don Jr. is up there. Donald Trump Jr. standing there. Kimberly Guilfoyle. Everybody's celebrating. And they start chanting, USA, USA. And it overtakes the whole stock exchange to the point that Jim Cramer can't even think. He has to stop speaking. Mortgage increases. I mean, oh. So you saw they, they barely even mentioned PSQ Holdings was a SPAC and went public this morning. Uh, so they barely reference what's happening. It, it must be bewildering to be a CNBC viewer. There's like actual news going on behind these guys and they refuse to even address it. It's like it's very Soviet. There's ve there's something very um, like, you know, Baghdad Bob about this. Like hey, everything's fine. There's nothing happening in the background. Just listen to Jim Cramer and his recommendations. And meanwhile, Donald Trump Jr., the pre the son of the former and perhaps future president of the United States, is up on the dais. You, oh sorry. So uh, that's happening. That was kind of fascinating. Uh, so that that was much more lively. What was going on on CNBC than anything coming out of the White House? You see the report today that Joe Biden is so enfeebled that the White House has had to cook up a bunch of ways to hide his age they can't it's it's gotten embarrassing uh, at this point they say biden has had to board air force one and 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 deep plane for that matter using a shorter set of retractable stairs that fold up into the belly of the plane and that the white house began doing this just a few months ago essentially hoping that the public wouldn't notice the thought at the white house is well, only the press is really there to watch this anyway, so it doesn't matter which stairs he comes down. And so long as he's, he's he's getting off the plane, who cares? We'll just do the shorter steps because he can't take the big ones. When he tries to walk up and down the big stairs, every stair you add to his journey is a chance that he's going to tumbleweed down. It's So they, they've decided no more tall stairs for Biden. They have to give him the tiny stairs. They give him these little kid stairs to get into the um into air force one how far are we from a chairlift how far are we from them installing a chairlift on the railing and just lifting joe biden up and then the media covering up you know the way they the the, the famous version of this was fdr fdr's medical condition was such that he was in a wheelchair but the media would do tight shots on his upper body so you couldn't see his legs in any of the framing how far are we from that <laughs> we're gonna like, and uh, there's Joe. He's approaching Air Force One. Oh, and we're going to cut away from that. And that's because they're putting him on the chairlift. I mean, at this point, somebody should just carry him up. Like, all right, shut the cameras off. And they get a couple Secret Service agents to you know, pick him up. You just probably need one at this point. He I don't think he weighs that much. Just carry him up 
into Air Force One. Uh, but So right now, they're still letting him take the, ch- uh, the stairs by himself. But they're the little stairs, the tiny stairs, to get in and out of the airplane. The new routine looks to be another subtle accommodation, Politico reports, to the president's age. It is hiding in plain sight, although the White House won't concede that interpretation. While many Biden advisors Politico contacted would not comment publicly on the change, two privately acknowledged an intentional shift to steer the 80-year-old president to the lower stairs more often to make his travel easier and limit the possibility for missteps. To make his travel easier? Have you ever referred to going up and down stairs as travel? <laughs> you you know things are tough when you start, you know, having to orchestrate travel plans around how many steps there will be. Ah, <laughs> uh, make his travel easier. Why climb 26 sometimes wobbly steps at Joint Base Andrews raised off the back of a pickup truck that drives up beside Air Force One when you have the option of stepping up or down just 14, especially when few outside the press corps are likely to even notice. That's funny. I think we've noticed. I think we've noticed. They uh, they say the stair car is too is too much. Um, you, you're familiar with the stair car. You ever see that movie, that show Arrested Development? <laughs> they owned a stair car. The family owned a stair car. <laughs> they, they drove it around everywhere. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Um, and, uh, it looked sturdy. It looked, it looked sturdy enough. There was all sorts of hijinks. People were constantly walking up and down that stair car, uh, and they did fine. They didn't fall down the steps, uh, but that's what happens with Joe. Aides are trying to limit situations, political reports, where any signs of physical frailty might be on heightened display and to ease the burdens of travel where possible. For instance, last week's leaders dinner at the NATO summit was the third such gathering Biden either skipped or left early in the past year. Yeah, because it was beyond the early bird special. They couldn't do a dinner past, what was it, like 7 o'clock? That's, come on now, that's too late. So Joe Biden ha- keeps skipping important dinners with foreign dignitaries because it's past his bedtime. He's just not with it. He can't handle it. I was talking to some family the other day. We were, uh, you know, wondering, as as many living rooms and kitchens probably do, about the cocktail of drugs they give Joe Biden in order to get him all fired up. Like, he's got to be on Adderall or something, right? They, they give him some, they give him some kind of speed for some of these events, no? Like an upper of some kind? If we had a White House doctor who would answer questions, we could get to the bottom of this, but that has never occurred. Under the Trump administration, uh, the White House doctors were constantly subjected to Q&As. Is he mentally with it? Has he passed a competence test? Are you lying to us? You say, uh, it, what's his blood pressure like? Like, he looks fat. He looks like he's going to die. Remember, there was like all, this, all these crazy questions. Remember, Sanjay Gupta went to the White House to demand answers? I don't believe you. Tell me, is he, he seems like he's about to die. It was like this, it was always this concern trolling about Donald Trump's health. And then Donald Trump would brag about the cognitive test he took and the, he, he got, he remembered all of the animals and pictures in order, and he relived it. And then the media made fun of him for reliving it. It was all so crazy. But now what they do is they don't even put the doctor in front of the press. We've had two health screenings of the president of the United States, two of Biden, two public reports. And then they release these summaries of his health. They say things like, well, he has a stiff gait. Yeah, I know that. I'm not his doctor. I can see he's got a stiff gait. Give us a little bit more than that. Well, he takes some blood pressure medication. No, you're not giving us the stuff we want. How incompetent is this guy? What kind of uppers do you have him on? How do you juice him up for events where he sounds a lot different than sometimes when he's falling asleep on the teleprompter? What's the difference between those two things? Can you please explain that? No. You saw recently they they revealed that Biden is now sleeping with a CPAP device, right, to keep air flowing into his lungs at night. Do you know why they revealed that? You know why they revealed that. Because he had strap marks all over his face. He came out in public. He was leaving for some excursion. They were putting him on Marine One, using tiny little steps for him. And he had strap marks all over his face. It was to the point that even the New York Times was like, what the hell's happening with his face? Oh, we can't cover this up. It's on photos. So they finally asked the White House. And the White House, oh, maybe uh, he's, uh, he's got sleep apnea. He began um, sleeping with a CPAP device recently. Recently? How recently? Can you be more specific? Where's the doctor? How come you never told us about this? And sleep apnea 
has been a part of his medical history since dating back to 2008. But guess when the last time they mentioned that was? 2008. That was the last time. You have to go back. You have to dig into press reports from 2008 when he was running for vice president for an acknowledgement that he had a history of sleep apnea. It never came up again during the presidential campaign, during his reelect with Obama. Never. The White House has never disclosed it. And only recently, because of all the strap marks all over his face, did they have to say something. So they're lying to you about his health. So what kind of drug cocktails is this guy on? It seems like a simple question. Uh, I'm, I'm putting it to the White House today, not holding my breath for an answer. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think they're going to tell me. Uh, let's see. Let's take uh, Peter and Alexandria, line two. Peter, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hey, Vince. How are you today? I'm good, Peter. So um, this is all about optics because – his his uh, office and his personal cabinet all are on the upper level. So even if he goes in uh, the lower stairs, he's still got to make his way up to the upper level, and that's not making things anything easier for you know, him. So, again, with this guy, it's all optics. Peter, Peter, um, well, well, let me ask you first and foremost, are you familiar with Air Force One uh, specifically, just given your work or anything? I, I am. Okay. So – now, that's, by the way, that's a super broad array of people, so I think you're safe in terms of your anonymity. But um, let me focus on that for a moment because I've been thinking about this too. When we see the images of the president leaving Air Force One from the traditional stair car, he's leaving at a higher level inside the plane is what you're saying. He's leaving on what I would guess is the second level of the plane? That's the main level. The main level of the plane, Okay. And then when he, if you leave yeah. out the back exit, you're leaving at a lower level. And that your point is, regardless, he has to take all these steps. He's just going to take half of them inside of the plane. That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, that answers the question. You're totally right. It's not actually about making it easier for him. It's about making it easier for the press shop to, in order to avoid a uh, chance that he collapses outside the plane. Because if he collapses inside the plane, they can deal with that and they can keep that secret from the public. If he collapses outside the plane... They've got a PR problem on their hands. I would agree with that. Yeah, I think so. All right, Peter, thank you very much. That's a good perspective uh, on uh, what's going on with uh, Air Force One. So even that, I'm so glad he pointed that. Even this is a scam. Even this idea that, what what's the phrasing here? They want to cover up. They obviously do want to cover up for an enfeebled president. Um, what was the, the, the quoting here? They said, uh, why climb 26 sometimes wobbly steps? raised off the back of a pickup truck when you have the option of stepping up or down just 14. Uh, well, even that's not true. He still has to take all 26 steps. He's just taken 12 of them inside. <laughs> Everything's a lie. Everything is a lie. Uh, let me take uh, Mike in Virginia, line three. Mike, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hey, Vince. Thanks for taking my call. Yes, sir. Um, I was thinking about it, and I told your call screener, Look at the VP debate between Paul Ryan and Joe Biden. Now, do you think that's the same Joe Biden that's serving today? I mean, he's lost a few thousand marbles since then, I think. The energy is totally different. And that, right. And so, you know, the poor guy, something's definitely changed here. Unquestionably. So, and they're cool. involved in this massive cover-up about it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, Mike, what's going to happen is a couple years from now, everyone's going to be like, oh yeah, we all knew that the whole time. Like, of course he was demented. Of course he, like, like there were people covering up for him constantly. Of course, Jill Biden was actually running the country. You know, it's going to be, it'll be old hat by that point. Ah, it's old news. And then at that point, and, we'll, and you and I will be asked to move on. Yep. It's the way these things play out. But Mike, thank you. Good point. It's a good reminder that old Paul Ryan debate where Joe Biden was a lot more feisty and to the extent that you could ever say a Joe Biden was with it. It was then he was quote with it. Um, although he's always been crazy. That's just a different thing. Senile that IRS whistleblowers go public this week with their claims that the federal government has been corrupted on behalf of the Biden crime family. Virginia Fox, a congresswoman from North Carolina. She was in that hearing yesterday I had some questions for those whistleblowers, and now we have some questions for her. She joins us moments away.